Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, special workshop organized uh, by the Hong Kong Young Academy of Sciences and the Hong Kong Young Industrialists uh, Council and the uh, Innovation and Technology uh, Commission. So uh, today I'm the chair, I will moderate the entire uh, uh, workshop. Uh, my name is Sujian Zheng. I'm a professor at uh, Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Uh, so today uh, uh, we will uh, have uh, two speakers, but before the uh, speakers, I would like to introduce our two uh, presidents of the uh, societies. Uh, one is Professor Anderson Sum, uh, president of the Hong Kong Young Academy of Sciences. And then is Mr. Paul Tai, uh, president of the Hong Kong uh, Young Industrialists Council. So uh, I would, first I would like to introduce uh, uh, Anderson, uh, so Professor Anderson Sum. He is a professor at the University of Hong Kong. He's an expert in uh, biomedical devices. I, uh, uh, so let's welcome uh, Professor Sum to give us a very brief uh, opening speech. Anderson, please. Thank you, Zizian. Mr. Paul Tai, President of the Hong Kong Young Industrialist Council, Shi Qi, Mingxing, Zizian, HKYIC members, fellow YSHK members, students, and everyone, good afternoon. The Hong Kong Young Academy of Sciences is honored to cooperate with the Hong Kong Young Industrialist Council, HKYIC, to organize the Industry Workshop 2022, Advanced Manufacturing Technology. This year marks the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Looking back on the past 25 years, there are some successful examples of scientific research transformation in Hong Kong. For example, the non-invasive prenatal test technology developed by Professor Dennis Lowe has been, um, trans has been done and transformed in Hong Kong. It is now used in more than 90 countries, benefiting 7 billion pregnant women every year. It can be seen that the industrialization of scientific research in Hong Kong can have a great impact. Innovation and technology is perceived to be a key engine, driving the diversification of Hong Kong's economy. The Hong Kong government has been taking a proactive approach to enhancing the INT ecosystem of Hong Kong, enabling high value added as well as creative and technology intensive new industries to lead the city's economy to take off again by fostering reindustrialization. In 2018, YASHK was established. We currently have 53 young scientists as our members. We do not only promote the science and technology education in Hong Kong and foster the development of the city to be an eminent international science, technology, and innovation center, but also actively collaborate with industrial and commercial sectors to strengthen the conversion applications of scientific research achievements. We actively cooperate with industries to promote the translation and application of scientific research findings, this is the third industry workshop we have jointly organized with HKYIC to introduce the latest technological developments and scientific discoveries to the industries. We have conducted a workshop on energy storage and AI and robotics. This time we are going to focus on advanced manufacturing technology. I am thrilled to be here to learn from our YASHK fellow member and ready to know more about their technologies just like you. I hope all of you will enjoy the workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anderson. Uh, now, let me uh, please invite Mr. Paul Tai. Paul, would you please give us also a opening speech, please? Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, Anderson, Professor Zhang, Professor Cheng, Professor Huang, friends and ladies and gentlemen. You can see I'm actually not outdoors, so that's why I have to wear the mask. I hope you. You don't mind. Um, it gives me great pleasure to join you all here today for the YASX and YIC Industry Workshops 2022. On behalf of the Hong Kong Young Industrialist Council, I'm most honored to have this opportunity to join hand with YASHK again. In the last two years, we have a lot of programs 
the Andersons already shared with you, we already have done three. Very exciting. And I think the, this is very important. We all have the same goal and share goal that research and development are essential for Hong Kong industrial development. We Hong Kong YIC are always in full support of the local R&D development and dedicated to strengthening the coordination of, amongst the government, industry, academia, and research sectors, so as to build Hong Kong into an international innovation and technology hub. So last but not least, I wish all of you enjoy the following presentation and have a fruitful afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, very much uh, uh, Paul. So I think after this uh, two uh, opening speech, uh, we would like to have a virtual group picture. So uh, please, for those who have and is convenient uh, uh, to open up the cameras, uh, please do. So you can turn on the camera and we'll say uh, a, a hi or a, a, a thumbs up. So, and, and Ada will take a, a picture for us, please. Okay, so uh, thank you, Ada. Right, uh, now I think we'll, we'll start our, our presentation session. So let me uh, talk about the rundown very briefly before uh, the presentation. So basically, we are going to have two 25 minutes uh, presentation. And then we'll have a 30 minute uh, discussion and Q&A session following the uh, presentation. So uh, please uh, put down your questions. Uh, you can type your question in the chat box uh, in the Zoom. And then I will, I'm going to read out the questions. And if the questions are very similar, I probably will combine uh, some of the questions together and raise the questions at the end. Okay, so let me uh, introduce the first speaker. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Professor Chen Shiqi from uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. So Shiqi is a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Automation Engineering. So he received his bachelor degree, Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the National Tsinghua University in Taiwan in 1999. And then uh, his uh, Master and PhD degree in Mechanical Engineering from uh, MIT uh, in the US in 2003 and 2007, respectively. Afterwards, he uh, worked as a postdoc fellow in uh, Harvard University in a medical school. And then later on, he had a, uh, worked in a company for a short while and then moved to uh, come to Hong Kong and started his independent career. Uh, so he's well known for his leading work in this advanced manufacturing. Uh, so uh, today he's going to give us a talk uh, in this uh, area. So the title of the talk is uh, Recent Advances in Micro-Addictive Manufacturing and 3D Nanofabrication. Sushi, would you please share your uh, screen and start your talk? Thank you. Sure. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, yes. Okay. Very clear. Um, <clears throat> So I would uh, first like to thank Zijian for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody to the seminar this afternoon. I'll take the opportunity uh, to share some of the research progress in my lab and talk about the area of microadditive manufacturing and uh, 3D nanofabrication. So before I start, I'll briefly introduce my lab. Our lab is uh, focused on generating the scientific knowledge uh, in designing ultra-fast imaging systems, precision machines, and laser fabrication systems. And today we'll be focusing on laser fabrication systems. Okay, so 3D printing technology has uh, revolutionized the engineering industry in the past two decades. Although there have been a lot of uh, rapid progress and development in the field, uh, there are still great challenges, especially lying in the area of micro-additive manufacturing. Although there are methods that can create sub 200 nanometer features in three dimension, um, you know, the speed is prohibitively slow and the cost is extremely high. I will give an example. If you want to uh, print 
a cubic centimeter size object with a 200 nanometer resolution, it would typically take uh, you know, one or two months and costing around hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you know that is not practical for any industrial application. So what if uh, we were able to print sub 100 nanometer resolution at a scale and speed, just like a regular 3D printer as shown on the right, and at the same cost, and in terms of material, we can use all kinds of material, then we believe uh, the engineering design process will be revolutionized again. And today I'll share with you some of our work that shed lights on this ultimate goal. So to begin, I'll introduce the most precise 3D printing process, two-photon polymerization. So the technology was first introduced in the late 90s and, and uh, everybody learns about it in 2001 by the uh, seminal work from uh, Kawada's group in Japan. And now everybody knows this uh, nano ox. About a few years later, the technology was commercialized by a German company called Nanoscribe. And today, most universities and research institutions will have a unit from Nanoscribe to print you know, uh, various uh, micro to nanoscale devices for experimental verification or scientific research. So on the upper right corner shows a you know, micro needle array for drug delivery application. Bottom right corner shows micro lens array for any imaging systems. So although TPP is a photopolymerization process, you can actually extend the material to other uh, areas and uh, different materials through uh, different methods. On the left shows if you print a TPP as a template by combining with electroplating, you can create pure metallic structures. Many people also mix nanoparticles with photoresin to make functional de uh, devices directly. In this example on the right shows a piezoelectric devices printed directly. If you mix mag magnetic particles, then you can create uh, micro robots maneuverable in body or uh, in vivo, which is a fast growing field. Another big uh, area of application is to directly print biocompatible and biodegradable tissue scaffolds. And all these were limited by the high cost and a slow printing speed. So if you wonder what uh, TPP can do in terms of uh, high throughput fabrication, in fact, you know, in comparison with e-beam lithography or very expensive diamond turning, TPP can be used to make uh, metallic molds. So you can start with uh, fabricating complex, you know, uh, 2D or 3D structures. Then you electroplate and make a metallic mold. Of course, uh, the polarity is inversed. And then you, you can use it with injection molding to make various parts. And this will be one low cost way to fast develop prototypes. Of course, ne this needs to be established on the fact that TPP is a low cost and efficient process. Okay. So next, um, uh, let me briefly talk about the basic principle of two photon polymerization. This is a process enabled by a nonlinear two photon absorption process enabled by an ultra uh, high peak power phenosecond laser. <clears throat> so due to the extreme high power within the focal point, uh, two photons will be uh, absorbed by an electron as shown in the Jablonski diagram on the left. Uh, it goes to a higher energy states and release free radicals that generates uh, the photopolymerization process. In comparison with a conventional stereolithography process, two photon process has depth discrimination. In other words, it only polymerizes material within the focal point that's much smaller than a size of one cubic micron. <clears throat> and also is very sensitive to uh, a polymerization threshold. So in other words, if you find control the laser power, you can rise structures much smaller than the diffraction limit. And that's why, uh, you know, much smaller features than the wavelength of light can be created. So this is what's been done in the past. So people pair the phenosecond laser with a pair of scanning mirrors. As a result, by raster scanning the laser focus, voxels can be created in a line by line, layer by layer fashion. So when one layer is completed, the laser um, is moved to the second layer by a specimen stage or piezoelectric objective scanner uh, to complete the 3D fabrication process. And this is very slow. 
So this video taken from NanoScribe illustrates this process. So you can see to print an aircraft as shown here, laser is uh, raster scanned horizontally as the fax axis, vertically as the secondary slow axis, and then it moves to the next plane. Although this process seems to be fast here, it is extremely slow because you know that the entire thing is smaller than the diameter of your hair. And uh, let me talk about a more uh, process. So during the uh, printing process, the objective lens is immersed in the photoresin, which is in liquid form, uh, which has a refractive index of 1.5. So in order to ensure high resolution, a matching index objective lens is used. So it's typically an oil immersion lens. So after fabrication, you take out a sample and develop it, and you can visualize the result in a high resolution electron microscope as shown here just now. Okay. So um, to make it practical, you know, not just me, a lot of people have been trying to uh, speed up the process. And one straight solution is to use multiple laser foci. So you can split the laser focus, for example, by using micro lens arrays or diffractive optical elements. But that usually has a fixed uh, focus pattern, so you can only write periodic structures. And also the, the focus quality is compromised. So we want to address the issue uh, by a different approach. In other words, to efficiently and quickly manipulate the laser wavefront. So first we survey different special line modulators. Uh, you know, there's uh, liquid crystal special line modulators, deformable mirrors. In the end, we decided to use a very unique device, which is the digital micro mirror device. This device, actually, everybody here online have seen it in the past because it is the very chip used in every projector and every movie theater made by Texas Instrument. So DMD, as a result, is very high resolution nowadays. It's 4K. It's also very high speed, up to 32 kilohertz. Each mirror is a binary uh, display. It only has um, plus minus um, or uh, 12 degree position. So when, um, when we combine a DMD with the nanosecond laser, you know, it becomes an ultra fast scanner. So what we do here is we design uh, specific holograms and because DMD is binary, so we design binary holograms and place it on the DMD. Then the phenosecond laser is introduced to the DMD as a reference pin. So as a result, the design hologram is recreated here. So some people may wonder how come this was not done in the past. And the reason is for the longest time, DMD is considered not comparable with the phenosecond laser because the pixels on the DMD are too small, which causes dispersion. And we address the issue with this uh, dispersion compensation design as shown in the US pattern here. And as a result, when we measure the pulse width after the DMD, it shows very narrow pulse width and the diffraction, diffraction effect has been entirely removed. So fortunately, the design of digital hologram theory is derived already in the 1970s. So whatever wavefront information we want to create, we just convert them from the analog equation form into digital form through the inequality shown here. So we substitute to this equation and if it satisfies the inequality and we have the value of one and otherwise zero. So everything turns into a black and white picture on the DMD as shown on the right and on the left shows um, the recreated wavefront. So next I'll talk about how to use the uh, the hologram to perform focus scanning. To perform axial scanning, we can just uh, design a spherical wavefront, which bends a planar wavefront into spherical shape with a specific focal length. So the left term on the inequality is so-called a tilted phase term, so which represents the special frequency on the, of a fringe pattern display on the DMD. So by varying the special frequency, we can then alter or move the focus laterally. So here we show a simulation of varying DMD patterns. As you can see, as the special frequency moves, the focal point would move as predicted. So based on our calculation under a 40X objective lens, we can fast control the focal point 
in the axial direction for about 500 microns and laterally for about 200 microns with a accuracy and minimum step size of about 100 nanometers, which is uh, sufficient for our target application. So then we briefly talk about how you know, holograms are synthesized. So we can design the lateral and axial position and superpose them directly. Once we design one focus, we can design all the other different focus and superpose them to form a single hologram. We can even design wavefront correction information and add it to the phase term here. And as shown in this video here, uh, Um, four laser foci are generated, and as you can see, each of the laser focus can be individually controlled to move within the same workspace. And they are actually making four different structures, but you only see two here because the other two are in a different depth. Okay, so here we briefly just, uh, compare the difference between the conventional process and our random axis scanning process using uh, this 2D home. So in raster scanning conventional process, laser has to be scanned layer by layer. So even if you have empty spots, you have to scan through them and you, you just turn off the shuttle, okay? In our process shown on the right, each uh, <clears throat> color represents one exposure. So we can expose multiple points simultaneously. We can build these pillars through a different beam mode, for example, the bezel beam. So as a result, these empty spaces, we don't really need to go there. And as a base on this principle, we increase the fabrication speed by around two orders of magnitude comparing with a point scanning process. So in 2018, we received the R&D 100 award for developing this uh, prototype. And it is simultaneously a two photon imaging system that people use to study a brain and neuron activities in vivo. And you can see some of the high resolution structures printed uh, in our earlier uh, system in 2019. You can see individual voxels uh, overlapped in this high resolution SEM images. In the recent uh, one or two years, we further enhance the performance of the system by using a regenerative laser amplifier. And nowadays we can use up to 2000 laser foci, achieving a two million voxel per second writing speed and breaking the record of resolution to down to 90 nanometers. So to quickly summarize, we use a digital micro neural device to perform high-speed multifocus scanning, and each focus is individually programmable and can perform random access scanning. In fact, uh, each focus can also carry different laser power, so they achieve grayscale control. Very, very capable system to create uh, three-dimensional structures. Uh, but we are not satisfied with the performance. Um, to further enhance the speed, uh, we come up with another idea. So in, instead of uh, splitting the laser focus, we were wondering whether we can focus the laser uh, instead of a point, but into a thin light sheet, which contains millions of points. And on the light sheet, is it possible that we create patterns? And the answer is, of course, yes. And uh, to uh, introduce the principle, let's briefly talk about the basic properties of femtosecond laser. As I mentioned, femtosecond laser, laser refers to a laser, uh, a pulse laser with very narrow pulse width of 100 femtosecond laser, uh, femtosecond. If you consider the time bandwidth product as a constant, you will realize that femtosecond laser contains many different colors, unlike continuous wave laser. So the bandwidth is wide. And that's why DMD would cause dispersion in the first uh, holography technique. We want to avoid this. Um, in this technique, uh, the so-called temporal focusing technique, we actually exploit and take advantage of the dispersion effect. So the femtosecond laser is brought to an optical grating. As a result, different color spectrums are dispersed. And when dispersion occurs, the peak power laser 
The laser peak power is lower and cannot perform multi-photon absorption or excitation effect. Then all these dispersed spectrons are recombined and only at the focal region they are overlapping. As a result, it forms a thin light sheet at the focal region and right after the focal region, light becomes dispersed again. Okay, so this slide uh, shows an image comparing with the conventional point scanning or so-called special focusing idea. So energy of a laser system is focused to this point and by raster scanning the point, material is processed. Uh, but along the light path, the pulse width remains a constant. In a temporal focusing system, we do not focus the laser beam. The laser beam diameter is adjusted to be equivalent to the processing area. As you can, can see along the light path, the pulse width is varying instead, and only at the focal plane, the pulse width is narrow and can have multi-photon effect. This idea was actually not invented by our group, of some of the microscopists in 2005. In order to use this for fabrication, we have to generate specific patterns on the light sheet, right, in order to perform fabrication. So that's where our contribution came in. We replaced the optical grating with a digital micro mirror device. As I said, DMD is a blaze grating with an angle of 12 degrees. So by selecting the proper diffraction order uh, in an experiment, the minus fifth order diffraction, we can achieve high laser efficiency around 50% and implemented uh, temporal focusing. So as a result, the DMD surface and the work plan is in conjugation. So whichever pattern displayed on the TM DMD will be displayed here. And next by uh, axial, axially moving the focal or light sheet around, we and by uh, changing the pattern accordingly, we can create arbitrary structures of high speed. So this slide shows a simulation of the intensity profile of the light sheet. You can see it has a thickness around uh, a few microns. It's extremely flat. So by just moving the light sheet around, we can drill flat bottom holes, which reaches a 50 nanometer surface roughness on nickel target. So we apply this uh, to two photon polymerization in working with uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory since 2015, where they developed custom uh, designed photo resins for us to deal with a high power uh, laser regenerative amplifier. So you can see using the system here, each exposure defines a layer but you're actually seeing a slow motion because every second we can define roughly a hundred to a thousand layers. So this further pushes uh, the fabrication rate of our previous system by one order of magnitude. Okay, you take out uh, the printed part, it's transparent in optical microscope, but in electron microscope, you can see fine log pile structures being created. You can also see these artifacts or defects caused by a dead DMD pixel. Another advantage of this system is the voxel aspect ratio is not conventional Gaussian being aspect ratio one to three. Instead, it's one to 1.25. And this is because uh, the voxel or resolution of a temporal focusing system is not determined just by the realized criteria. In other words, wavelength and numerical aperture. It is also simultaneously determined by the pulse width. The narrow the pulse, the thinner the light sheet. So by carefully selecting the spectrum in, in combination with the numerical aperture and wavelength, we can tune the aspect ratio of the voxel in a temporal focusing system. As shown here. So from a one to three ratio, we make it a one to 1.5 ratio, which is resulting in superior mechanical property of the printed structures. So by carefully studying the laser dosage relationship with a structural integrity, we can create all kinds of three dimensional structures. For example, this column has a diameter roughly equivalent to uh, your hair and various large scale structure that cannot be created in the past. And also the cost is reduced by around 95% and the throughput is now roughly 100 cubic millimeter 
per hour versus originally 0.1 cubic millimeter per hour. Okay. As a result, this work was published uh, in the science magazine. And if you see this work in comparison with all other works, you can see most other works, they're playing with the trade-off between speed and resolution. So high resolution, low speed, high throughput, low resolution. But we fundamentally address the issue and simultaneously achieve high speed, high resolution, and low cost through this work. Okay. But there is a limit on the resolution we can achieve, roughly 100 nanometers. On the other hand, many um, meta structures, especially in visible light applications predicted by scientists, require features below 50 nanometers. And that's some area that we are working on right now. And uh, with limited time, I can briefly talk about the idea. Essentially, we use a hydrogel as a substrate because hydrogel is swellable. So we print structure on the hydrogel in ex expanded states using our light sheet system. And after that, we follow by a material deposition process. And lastly, we can shrink the hydrogel by putting it into the hydrochloric acid. As a result, we can create all these freestanding three-dimensional meta structures of you know, 20 nanometer resolution. And you can see the resolution test to be uh, less than 50 nanometers. We also try with different materials. Um, you know, the materials now include metals, metal alloys, metal oxides, semiconductors, or even biomaterials. And uh, since this work is currently under review, I would uh, limit the discussion here. So if you're interested in learning more, welcome to approach me uh, privately. So now I would like to summarize uh, the work I presented today. So based on digital micro mirror device and ultra fast lasers, we have uh, you know, uh, introduced new 3D printing systems that achieve substantially increased speed without compromising the resolution. The light sheet system further improved the speed um, by an order of magnitude and reducing the cost. And lastly, we talk about a swellable hydrogel platform in creating three-dimensional meta structures. So with that, I will conclude uh, my seminar. And of course, everything you see here was not done by myself, but by my students and my team. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shi Now, let me uh, introduce the second speaker. Again, I, I would like to emphasize that if you have a question, please put down your question in the chat box. I will I'll ask that after the second speaker finish his uh, talk. So second speaker, uh, Professor Mingxing Huang. Uh, professor Huang is now a professor at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he received his uh, Bachelor of Engineering and Master of Science uh, in Mechanics from uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University in 2002 and 2004, respectively. And then he received his PhD in Material Science in 2004 from uh, Delphi University of Technology in the Netherlands. After uh, finishing uh, his PhD, then he worked as a research engineer in a, in a company. And then he come, came to Hong Kong in uh, 2010. So he's known for his expertise in all this uh, engineering materials, uh, stainless steel, for, uh, for example, and alloys. So today he's going to give a talk uh, on uh, anti-COVID-19 stainless steel. Mingxing, uh, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Asijian, for a uh, very kind introduction. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the, uh, Thank you for joining the seminar. I, today, I would like to introduce our latest results on a special, uh, very special uh, stainless steel uh, that can actually uh, kill this COVID, uh, this, uh, this SARS, uh, this uh, uh, virus, COVID-19. So the idea for this one um, uh, is to, uh, is during this pandemic, we like to invent something which is can be useful. So uh, this is a team together. We work with the medical school in uh, Hong Kong U. So uh, uh, my team here together with the PhD uh, student uh, Liu Li Tao here and with the uh, professor uh, Leo Pun at the medical school and Dr. T. Alex Chan 
also from the uh, medical uh, school. So uh, this funding was, uh, this project was funded by RGC and ITF uh, uh, project. But originally this project was aiming to develop a stainless steel um, for this uh, influenza, for uh, influenza uh, H1N1 uh, virus. Uh, that was in the, uh, the project start a few years ago before the pandemic. So when the pandemic starts in 2000, uh, 2020, so we switch our focus. So because at the beginning, we thought if we are able to kill influenza, we might be able to uh, inactivate the, um, uh, this uh, COVID-19 virus. So that's why we switch. And with the help of the medical school, using their lab, uh, uh, laboratory uh, facilities, then we can do the uh, testing. Okay, that's the idea. So it's a brief introduction about the, uh, basically the uh, use of the stainless steel basic is a daily, sorry, um, is a daily product. You can see everywhere, basically uh, in the MTR, in the metro system, in the, uh, you have door notes and the toilet buttons and the leaf buttons, they are grip, because for bad, I mean, really you see many, many applications using stainless steel. So of course this uh, COVID uh, that has one of the form for transmission that's surface contact. So our stainless steel here is talking about surface contamination, uh, not this uh, by through airborne transmission. So uh, because one basically, if you have a, a, a cold droplet, you may have a lot of these uh, droplets containing a virus. And this virus, if they stop in the uh, uh, normal stainless steel, that can last for a two or three days. This virus, you still can detect live virus, which is transmissible. So the idea is that um, to prevent just uh, for this surface contamination for the uh, transmission. So if you, some, if you uh, remember the really at the very beginning, of the pandemics, you see many people when they go into the lift, they will use their key or the tissue to push the lift buttons. And actually, the uh, we are actually uh, seeing that, and there's an inspiration saying, why not? We if we are able to develop a stainless steel, but not using coating, because if you're using coating on the surface for the anti virus, with the time this coating will disappear. So the idea is that if we are able to develop a stainless steel, which can be used for a, as a permanent antivirus um, uh, uh, properties. So that means you don't need coating. So the stainless steel itself must has this antivirus properties. So that's the driving force behind why we try to develop this new uh, stainless steel with these uh, antivirus um, properties. So after we uh, did this, um, uh, we, we make this stainless steel with a special uh, chemical composition. And uh, in the, if you go to the um, literature, uh, you can see that actually antibacterial stainless steel has been developed there over there for 20 years or more than 20 years, but that's antibacterial. So antivirus is different because bacteria and virus are very different species. So in this case, the, um, the inactivation mechanism is different. So uh, there's no really, we can search for the literature. So there's no really stainless steel. Can talk about uh, the antivirus. Okay, stainless steel that can uh, be used for antibacteria uh, available in the market, but stainless steel that can uh, be used for antivirus are not available. In the market so basically it's no so that's why we, we do it so uh, we develop differences so this is an experimental results uh, we and this is a sample how we do the testing is basically the sample we make a droplet this is a virus content droplet and then we drop onto the surface okay just to simulate the contamination when you're speaking when you're coughing you have a droplet dropping on the surface Okay, so uh, in this uh, case, what you can see, 
is the uh, we wait for a given period of time for one hour to 48 hours. And then we try to measure how many the percentage of virus are still uh, uh, viable. That means it's still live uh, virus, okay? So the very beginning is zero time, okay? Zero time. Look at this 316L stainless steel. This is a very conventional stainless steel. This is a conventional uh, stainless steel. There's a point to so for the stainless, conventional stainless steel, you can see that actually after 48 hours or 24 hours, you still have a live uh, virus on the surface, okay? Not mentioned for a few hours. And this is the conventional stainless steel. And we also uh, try because uh, uh, copper and silver are known, copper and silver are known for antibacterial properties. Okay, so antibacteria is very different to antivirus. So in this case, we also try a pure copper and pure silver. You will see that pure silver is surprisingly, at the very beginning, we thought pure silver might be also to use to as an antivirus uh, because pure silver is good for antibacteria, but our results shows that anti this silver is not better is not much better than stainless steel. So in other words, silver itself is not working for antivirus properties. Then we see pure copper. This is the pure copper. Now pure copper is the best, okay? So we do the testing, we see pure copper even under one hour or three hours later, pure copper shows the best antivirus properties. So it means basically you, have 90.99% of the virus are killed. So uh, even if six hours later, you cannot detect any virus. Okay, so pure cover is the best. So then we using a uh, powder metallurgy technology to make stainless steel, SS stands for stainless steel. That containing different silver contents and all silver different copper contents. So for stainless steel containing silver contents, this blue line and this light uh, blue here. So you see this stainless steel containing silver does not have this antivirus properties. And then we check one represent 1%, one weight percent of copper, five weight percent of copper, 10% of copper and 20% of uh, copper. So you can see that this uh, stainless steel with different um, the uh, copper content, you see the properties is different. Okay, for look at this twenty percent copper, which is the best in terms of the antivirus properties for the stainless steel, and this ten percent copper also has these properties. Let's say anti after twenty four hours, there's no more as uh, 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 live virus can be detected. So if taking for potential applications. If you're taking 20% copper in the stainless steel, you see that after this one is almost about 99.9% .9 of the virus will kill within three hours. So the amount of virus was reduced uh, on the surface then the, to trans, the possibility of getting, uh, let's say, uh, uh, infected, affected by this virus, it to be lower, okay? So less virus on the surface, the probability for infection will be lower. So in this case, we consider 20% of stainless steel, uh, stainless steel with 20% copper, we have a very good application potentials for, let's say, uh, leaf buttons. Well, because usually you do, you make to clean the leaf buttons every two or three hours. That means using our stainless steel, uh, in this case, even you don't do the cleaning within three hours, the amount of virus on the surface is very low already, okay? So this can help to reduce the risk of this uh, transmission, okay? So uh, we also check, we also check the, um, the, uh, 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 the ability for anti-H1N1, okay? So we can see that our 20% of uh, 
uh, stainless steel, stainless steel with 20% copper, also show a good anti H1N1 virus properties. Of course, once again, copper is the best, but silver, again, silver is just the same as the normal stainless steel. So uh, means silver is only working, it's working very good for antibacteria, but is not working uh, for antivirus. But this anti copper, the copper works for both. But if we use pure copper, pure copper is more expensive, right? So stainless steel can lower the cost. That's why we should still do stainless steel. In addition, the appearance of stainless steel is different. For, for any product you like a stainless steel property, like the hardness, the strength, the, uh, uh, the wear resistance, the cost, and in this case, stainless steel uh, always better than the copper. Okay, so for like uh, leaf buttons, you don't use pure copper to make leaf buttons, but you use stainless steel or the hand, uh, uh, the, um, also other uh, applications where you have stainless steel, but you don't use uh, pure copper. And in addition to the antivirus properties, we also check our antibacteria properties. So clearly, uh, pure copper is also very good. Uh, if you, you don't see any bacteria here, okay? So this is the stainless steel. After 24 hours, you see a lot of stain, uh, bacteria. So it means normal stainless steel doesn't have this antibacterial property. Uh, also does not have the antivirus properties. But for pure copper, you have the antivirus property. You also have antibacterial properties. So for our... Um, materials with 10% or 20% copper, you also have excellent antibacterial uh, properties. So uh, in short, this stainless steel with 20% has the best antivirus and also antibacterial properties, okay? The reason why, why is uh, our stainless steel can have this antibacterial properties. So basically, if you look at the microstructure, so uh, it's ten percent of the copper. You will see that all these white dots are copper precipitates. Okay. Now this color here represents the copper. So you see uh, also the X-ray. Uh, these are EDX. For the EDX, you also see this copper here. So clearly, we have this copper uh, precipitation in this stainless steel. In the normal stainless steel, you do not have these copper precipitations, okay? For higher copper contents, we are going to see more, more of this copper precipitation. So basically, we change the microstructure of the steel. And the, we also check the concentration. We check the concentration of the copper ions, okay? So we expect that because of the copper ion release, and this copper ion is kind of reacts with the virus or the bacteria that leads to the death of the bacteria or the inactivation of the virus. You can see that for pure copper, the pure copper with a, a few hours later, the copper concentration is very high because you are pure copper itself, okay? But then if you have a lower copper content, 1% copper, 5% copper, you see the copper concentration is low. So with this 10%, 20% copper, you see, which is reaching quickly within a very quick short time, reaching very similar to pure copper properties. So in this case, so that is explaining why a higher copper content can be a better antibacterial or antivirus stainless steel. We also check similar uh, for this uh, silver. You will see the values here is a 20 percent PPN of silver uh, ions are very low, so 0 0.2. That could be also one of the reasons why the pure silver does not have this antivirus or antibacterial properties. So basically what we are doing, uh, we try to make a demonstration whether or not our steel, our stainless steel can be used in a daily life product, like leaf buttons or uh, in other applications. So we make the two leaf buttons, 
using our stainless steel based on a powder metallurgy technique. Okay, uh, we can also do casting. We can also do a conventional casting. Can to make uh, this one, but conventional casting may have some technical challenges to be solved. But uh, we are working on on that now to solve the technical challenging if we're using conventional casting to containing such high copper content. But if we use if we use powder metallurgy, it's quite easy. And powder metallurgy is a, a, a well established. It's a well established technology uh, actually to be uh, uh, can be available easily. So by uh, powder metallurgy door sintering, now we can make these products and which we already uh, can be already done. So we have a pattern applied uh, already. And this uh, pattern was awarded a silver medal in this uh, 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 Geneva invention. And we also published this one in a, a scientific journal. And the, actually it's also very interesting. The, the, this has been uh, um, why when we have this press conference, uh, overseas in uh, companies, uh, many companies are actually contacting Hong Kong U for potential applications using. And even also, uh, uh, we also have interviews at BBC and then that's really showing the interest. And we also discussing with some of the uh, companies at this moment to see if we can license the patents for them to make a daily product, daily products using, I mean, in, in using stainless steel. So that's, I uh, would like to summarize that we have invent a new stainless steel containing a high copper contents that can kill uh, virus, including this COVID-19 and also influenza uh, virus and also bacteria. And then this product can be made using existing industrial facilities. And then all with, with a low cost, which can really I hope that we can um, make it into a daily product. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mingxin. So I think uh, now we enter the uh, discussion session. So I already received quite a few uh, questions. Uh, so please, if you have questions, please post them uh, out as well. Okay, so I think Shi Qi is with me now. Uh, so I will first ask questions uh, uh, to Shi and then I'll probably swap that and force. Now, uh, the first question to, to Shi is, Professor Chen, how small can you, the item be printed by your 3D printer? And what kinds of industries are eager to use this, uh, you know, items or parts to replace anything existing? So can you give this more general uh, question? I think the, the standard two photon lithography technique has a resolution around 100 to 200 nanometers. So they can be used to create, uh, you know, optical devices, gratings, um, and our new technique can further reduce the size to uh, below 100 nanometers. So how to use the resolution is still to be explored because, uh, you know, fabricating these things of the resolution in three dimension has never been realized in the past. So, um, you know, I give examples of, uh, you know, turning uh, TPP printed structures into metallic modes. So that would be a way to utilize them to make, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, cell phone lenses, uh, miniaturized uh, uh, spectrometers, uh, portable ones. Uh, so those would require uh, components to be printed through our technique. But there are also other applications like, uh, you know, tissue scaffolds. So those are the bio or medical applications with a uh, cost reduction, um, they can be potentially used in all kinds of fields, just like regular 3D printers. Yeah. Okay, so uh, following that question, there's one specific uh, question about this uh, meta surface. So I think uh, the question was written down in, in Chinese, uh, but then I translate to English, is that uh, according to some reports previously, that uh, your uh, nano 3D print, I believe, can also print some metal surface for this uh, application. Uh, can you do that or how, how did you do that? Is it appropriate for making some maybe military uh, type of applications? Well, yes. So I guess a uh, meta surface or meta structures are a broad term describing, you know, a wide range of optical and me mechanical structures that possess properties that are not natural. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, 
making things invisible is one, uh, you know, like invisible cloak is one possible application. So if you apply that structure into aircraft, you can make them invisible for visible light range. So that's possible. Um, so, you know, different frequency ranges require uh, different uh, scales of structures. And of, of course, you can also design structures that covers a broad uh, frequency range. And uh, I think all of them demands very fine structures to be made that uh, beyond the current manufacturing capability. So that's why these works are important for the you know future perspective. Right. Yeah, I think I think this indeed uh, there are quite a lot of possibility because it's a manufacturing tool, right? So in principle, the application can be very very wide. Uh, another question. I think it, it even looks further since the AI industry is also developing rapidly. How many years after, after you know, and, and or, or do you presume that AI can help us to design and making these three D products that? are more cost effective and less time costly? I think it's already helping. So a lot of manufacturing industries are already using AI in optimizing their, uh, you know, protocols, you know, all kinds of process. For example, even the semiconductor industry, TSMC in Taiwan is implementing AI in all their uh, processing steps. You know, for 3D printing, you know, AI can also help uh, optimizing the trajectory in the design process, uh, you know, choosing materials. So, uh, and I think people are continuing, uh, you know, uh, growing the, the adoption of AI techniques. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I will pause a little bit here and switch it uh, to, to Huang, uh, Professor Huang and I'll come back to uh, Shi Xi later. So uh, Mingxin, you talk about a lot of uh, this uh, COVID or anti-COVID-19 one. And I think there are some questions related to the general uh, versatility of the technology, right? So number one question is, it, is it also anti, uh, you know, Omicron or other uh, type of uh, uh, COVID-19 variants? That's number one. Another one is, uh, does it also uh, can kill uh, for example, for enzymes or, or normal like a, a cold viruses? Any comment yeah. on that? Yeah, so for influenza, we did already H1N1. Uh, that act is quite uh, uh, active, so it's no problem. We can uh, inactivate, we can kill the influenza. Uh, for the Omicron, uh, we just recently, but not yet published in the, in the data, and recently uh, the medical school is helping us to do a testing. The preliminary results are also uh, positive. That means our stainless steel can also, especially 20 percent copper stainless steel can also kill this uh, Omicron uh, virus. Because for us, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of a mechanical or physical killing mechanism. It's a physical a killing mechanism. Uh, it's different to the drugs. So in a way, they, um, it is, it, for us, it should be a, a quite a broad application. So, but we need to do more testing for other types of virus. But at this moment, the virus we test, this is working uh, properly, yeah. Right, uh, okay. So uh, the, another question is other than copper, uh, is there any other metal or, or mineral that can also uh, perform similar functions? Yes, it's a very good question. Uh, we, at the beginning, we thought silver is very good. Silver, as in the ancient Chinese uh, saying, silver is good for, for, let's say, healthy, for killing this bacteria. Okay, we thought silver uh, may be also good for killing virus. Silver is very good in killing bacteria, but surprisingly, after our experiment, we found that silver is not working. But for other metals, uh, we haven't tried many, uh, but uh, zinc is, has been reported good for killing bacteria. But there's really no one report a zinc, as far as I know, killing <laughs> virus. So at this moment, we are trying a copper, we have tried silver, uh, in this moment, it looks uh, copper is working very properly, but not silver. But other metals we haven't tried, but uh, that could be there, but we just don't know yet. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think, uh, come back to this material issue, I also would like to know, um, so in, in, in the mechanical properties, uh, so how, how does it change if you mix your stainless steel with this other metal? 
Yes, very good. So uh, in terms, because I, I didn't show in the presentation, it was shown in the publications, but clearly we compare the tensile properties, the mechan mechanical properties, the strength, which can reach about 500 megapascal, which is the same, very similar to the normal stainless steel. The elongation reduced a little, but it's still sufficient for any application. We can still go to beyond 30% of the tensile uniform uh, elongation. So in this case, it's quite ductile, it's quite strong, uh, like just you behave like a normal uh, stainless steel. Of course, only one drawback, uh, we do have drawback. The drawback is the reduce the corrosion resistance comparing to this 316L. So uh, our corrosion resistance is, is also shown in the publication. It's actually similar to a 200 series of stainless steel because 300 stainless steel has the best uh, in terms of commercial, normal commercial available uh, stainless steel is, the, is very good for corrosion resistance, but 200 is lower, is lower. But in our case, it's, we, we test is similar to a 200 uh, series of stainless steel. So that's, that's really one of the drawbacks. Yeah. Okay, that, that, that's uh, 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 good enough, I believe, uh, because copper is known for this uh, poor corrosion resistance. Uh, uh, another one is about this uh, hazard to human body. Yes, uh, the, because, I mean, stainless steel is using copper. Copper has been used for many, I mean, even you have copper pots in the kitchen. Right. So, I mean, you have stainless steel pots in the kitchen in your daily life. So uh, we are not putting into it as implants. We are not putting into your body. It's a surface contact. It's just a touching, like we do a stainless steel, let's say lift buttons and hand uh, uh, um, door handles, for instance, is a touch or maybe in the, uh, I mean, it, just touching. So in this case, we don't worry about the uh, harmful to a human because copper, you, you feel it, I mean, you. You touch it, stainless steel, you touch it. So in this case, I don't worry. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay, right. So there's an, another very detailed technical question, I think, for, for uh, Shi Qi. So how efficient or how energy efficient are the DMD-based microscopes? What optimizations are in place to reduce energy usage and what other possible optimizations could be made in order to improve energy efficiency? Well, this question is uh, not directly towards the material I presented, but the DMD microscope instead, one of our uh, published work. I assume uh, the, you know, the person who asked the question have read the paper. So uh, theoretically, the, the best uh, efficiency is around 10%, but practically I think it's below 5% in terms of laser power efficiency. But these days, um, you know, the laser, laser systems are all high power. So, and for imaging, usually we need around only 50 milliwatt versus a four watt laser. So low efficiency um, at the present point is not limiting the performance of a DMD microscope. Yeah. Okay, right. So I think uh, I will turn to uh, one more question for, uh, What was this question to? Okay, uh, for Mingxing, and then we'll come back to some more general common questions. So the question to you is uh, for your uh, stainless steel, are they going to be you know, rapidly applied in transportations as one, and, and it, are your technology can be somehow applied to plastics using a similar, I'm not sure. Uh, I think he's asking, is there any technology that can be applied similar to your uh, or kind of uh, results, but, apply to plastic, not stainless steel. Oh, okay. So, um, yes, if not stainless steel, you can, if you use the other metals and alloys, uh, I think as long as you have copper, enough copper. So for instance, you, you can use bronze, you can use other, let's say high copper. I think the uh, antivirus properties will be also there, not necessarily to be stainless steel. Because- But, but, but the question is asking to plastics. So not like plastic, a yes. right? Not metals. So plastic, I a polymer. I don't know how you put such a high copper content into a polymer base. Um, if you are able to make this copper into a polymer base, let's say polymer base composite, for instance, you using copper powders together with the composite 
in polymer. I guess so could be possible, but we haven't tried. We haven't. Tried. I think it's quite possible. I mean, for example, in our group, we do a lot of copper fabrics, copper fibers uh, and textiles and, and, and copper coatings on uh, plastic. That's exactly what we do in the lab. And yeah, in that case, yeah. no problem. Okay, so, in that case, adhesion and not, 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 not leaking, not going out. And that could be a, a, a good way to try. That could be a right. good way to try. So um, probably our stuff is, is also antivirus. Uh, I think that re uh, record me, recall me, I actually wrote a proposal to ITF. Ah, okay. You saying that our stuff is COVID, anti-COVID-19 and asked them to fund us. They didn't fund us. <laughs> so from your result, it looks like our stuff should be naturally anti-COVID-19 yeah. uh, yes. or, or, or whatever uh, <laughs> influenza. Actually, we, we, we quote, you know, SARS-CoV-2 and the influenza in the study, but they, they didn't fund us. Um, mm. We you should you should you should get the real data. I mean, you welcome to Hong Kong, you, and to do uh, this real data, real testing. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I, I contacted Leo too. Uh, Leo was yeah. too busy. His lab is uh, fully occupied. So mm -hmm. yeah, we'll talk about that later. Sorry for yeah. the uh, interruption. Right. So so let let's go to some more general questions. I think about technology transfer, etc., and etc. There's also one questions. Uh, I think I think asking all of us that. Related to nano fabrics or clothes, I don't know what does this refer to, right? And I, I, that, that's a, a question in Chinese is the, uh, what estimation do you think that nano clothes or nano fabrics will, will be on the market? Uh, What's the bottleneck of this kind of technology? I think probably, I'm not sure. I'm not sure is, is the question related to Shi Xi or because none of us here are doing actually nano coating for clothes, right? even though I think we somehow understand a little bit of the common sense. So, but I think a related question to that is that, uh, how do we do the technology transfer? Uh, I think there are several questions actually related to this, and uh, how long does it take, for example, for us to do this kind of research to this stage? Looks like there are applications already being applied. Uh, number two is that what's the biggest uh, difficulties of finding, you know, uh, collaboration, uh, collaborators uh, for commercialization or for production, etc. So maybe I think any of you can start to reply or comment. Maybe I can do a quick, uh, 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 you know, because our pattern uh, has been applied and the, we shouldn't sign in a, uh, let's say, pattern uh, transfer to a company. We are on the way. Uh, things should be quickly uh, soon. We uh, is one company uh, interested using our uh, technology to make their products. So the Hong Kong U is actually uh, negotiating. I think soon they can be signed this uh, one. So how to do? I think this is really depends on uh, my understanding that the um, uh, the product has to be. If you want to be easy, quick to the industry, uh, you should not change too much of the production line. That's my understanding. If you change a lot the production line, you take time, you need to educate the market, uh, uh, the investors, I mean, the companies need to invest a lot of money to change production line. So in our case, we're using existing production lines that's uh, mature enough uh, so that we just change the chemical composition of the Alloy. So that's something I like to share. If you like to speed up, the don't change too much the production lines. Uh, the supply trends. If you change a lot of supply trends, I think this will be very low. That's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. So not changing too much of existing technology or, or processing, right? But at the especially the processing. Yeah. Right. How about Shishi? You are in a very different industry. Well, I think in terms of uh, technology transfer, there are usually uh, two routes. One is, you know, we can start our own uh, spin-off company and seek, uh, you know, government support in terms of funding and working with larger companies. And the alternative route is we have license, uh, we have patents, and, you know, we are hoping larger companies will come and license uh, the patent and we assist them in commercializing uh, the product. Yeah. So these are the, you know, uh, often routes. 
Right. Uh, I think I, I can supplement to that because we also have uh, star companies and we also find very difficult to commercialize our technology, our flexible batteries and, and then metallic fabrics. Uh, I think in, in, in Hong Kong in general, because uh, the industry is quite specialized uh, in, in certain directions, right? And so, so it's actually, and the production is not in Hong Kong, probably in some other cities close to Hong Kong in, in, or in other countries. So, so it, it, it's indeed, uh, uh, number one, it would be quite difficult for us as academics to talk to uh, correct industrialists. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, that's why I think uh, having this YIC, uh, Hong Kong, ASH, uh, ASK, uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, joint workshops is very, very meaningful so that you can, everybody can know each other and then uh, knowing the technology that we develop in the university and knowing the uh, needs in the industry. So, so we can collaborate in the future to start with some collaboration and discussions. And, and, uh, and I also agree that um, from mentioning that uh, if you want to commercialize something, you want to uh, minimize the cost or, or, the, or, the, or, or the, what would say, the, the travel that, uh, from the industry, right? And then give them uh, more uh, added values. So I think from a academic point of view, sometimes we are a bit naive that we don't really know what's the pain, uh, uh, paining point in the industry. Right. Even though we think our technology is brilliant, uh, we may sometimes be naive that we think this is what industry needs, but actually that's not what the industry needs. And so, so, so then it, it, again, this, uh, this uh, joint forum will create opportunity uh, for the industry to tell us what is necessary, what's their pain points, and so that some of us may fit in to solve your problem as well. So I think this is a bilateral uh, or multilateral discussion uh, is needed uh, um, to have this sort of uh, 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 further moving uh, towards the commercialization uh, process. Uh, now, let me see, I think there's uh, more questions coming in while we are doing the discussion. I think most of the uh, audience will be interested in um, uh, for example, our technology can we how how can we just lobby to the internet to the government <laughs> to our government to to have them apply in a more like a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger scale or how can the government help us apart from the industrialists uh, to to commercialize the technology? Uh, anyone want to comment on that? Uh, since now we we were, we were going to have a new uh, new government, right? Uh, and, <laughs> and then, and then, Professor Sun Dong from City U is going to be uh, the was the uh, a, a leading person in this uh, reindustrialization and then commercialization innovation technology. So maybe I maybe I can just share what I I have experienced when I I, I was studying outside and then I, I I've seen. So in if you look at Europe, and um, there are many. Let's say in Germany or in other countries, there are many PhD students are actually supported by the company, which and also supported by partially by the government. Look at the uh, France and Germany where they're really heavy industry involved. So a PhD student, maybe half half, is supported by the government and by the industry. And the uh, universities, we do the research which relate to the industry, but it's not developing products. The university should not do that, should not develop product for a specific company because we are using a taxpayer's money. But we are developing a fundamental understandings relate, relate to the uh, industry. For instance, a common knowledge that industry A and industry company A and company B both can use to develop further their products. At the same time, we also train those students which has an industry, because they also collaborate with the in industries during the PhD. So after the graduation, these PhD students naturally, uh, many of them are actually work in this company, in the eye, in the center of these companies. So basically the company does not spend another four years to train a fresh graduate to be a sufficient engineer. So in this way, it's a really a win-win situation. The company, if they also, 
can knowledge at the same time they already pre-schooling, pre-training a very good engineers for their use. So in this case, what we can propose, maybe we can propose government doing something similar idea. So the government can propose this kind of a supporting for the PhD students or for the postdocs. Usually it's the PhD students always the good case. In this way, the project, the project is a very industry related. It's not only by the RGC type, purely fundamental research. So we need RGC fundamental, but in this ITC projects, this could be a very useful an idea. That means like we create two types of PhD uh, students. Work, one is working really in the industry related problems. Yeah, that would be my uh, one of my suggestions if we like to propose. Right, that, that, that's actually uh, has been running a lot of very successfully in Europe. Uh, and it's quite unique in Europe, I would say, to say, right? Especially in the European uh, mainland, the continent. Uh, yes. not, not the UK. Yeah, right. It, so my, my, my PhD was really like this way. And many of my friends are, are doing the same thing. So uh, after they're working in a company for a few years, it's not necessarily like for myself. I work for the company a few years and there are a few I like to go to academy, you can change. So, uh, but then in this case, I have to really experience, I can speak the language as the industrial uh, engineers we speak. So in this way, the collaboration between the university and the industry will be a lot easier because as long as you speak the same language, in this way, same technology language, the collaboration will be a lot easier. Right, I think this is a quite a good way that the government and then the, 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 the industry and the university can work together to think about that. Uh, Shichi, do you have any comment? Because uh, you are from mostly from the US background and you also work for a company, right? Or for companies. Before right. you I think, become academic. Right. I, I think in US there is a, a, a specific grant category called a small business innovation grant. So that is actually for small companies to apply uh, or jointly apply with um, universities. That's the STTR grant. So I think in US, you know, many universities have already working uh, with uh, industries, but you know, the school's fundamental purpose is to perform research. So by the end of a PhD or a project, it's usually just a prototype and there's a big gap between real products. And at this point, many companies would hesitate to directly invest because you know, it may take many years. So at this point, you know, uh, many small companies or startups or even you know, middle-sized companies will apply for a small business innovation grant or SBIR grant for support. So each award is about 1 million US dollar. Uh, and many middle-sized companies are actually surviving on these uh, grants until their product become matured. And the definition of a small company is any company that less than 500 employees. I think in Hong Kong, that's not, you know, really a small company anyway, with, uh, you know, engineers. Right. Death of 500, right? <clears throat> so that, I think that really closed the gap between uh, school prototypes and mature products, yeah. Right, may I know this one million, is it like upfront or is it like a reimbursement based type of grant? It's uh, upfront, but it's usually it consists of uh, two phases. So you you apply for phase one, so that's usually around 150,000 US dollar, uh, but it's six months. But if you have more results, you can, you know, uh, directly apply for phase one and two. And they will give you the money and you, you, you use them. It's not reimbursement based. Yeah. And so essentially they will give you money to, uh, but it's essentially for, uh, you know, a gray area between product development and research. And they will not uh, uh, take companies' shares. It's just a government award. Yeah. As recently. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I think in, in Hong Kong, we don't have this kind of uh, award. It's more, uh, for example, the science park or the biotech uh, is more on the in reimbursement base. Right, and right. then uh, take the example that I, the company I get involved, uh, the reimbursement started for, for example, like a, for a postdoc or, or like a human uh, a manpower uh, reimbursement. It started once your company actually are in the science park 
and then it only can be start. You can only start to apply after you are actually there for a month. Right. And then it took a few months to for the government to vet it, and after you they, they you they, they they granted your applications, then you probably wait another six months before you can apply for reimbursement, and the application for reimbursement will probably take another one to three months. So that means after you start up starting your company, you'll probably take one year before you can actually get any reimbursement of manpower. And manpower in Hong Kong, as a startup, probably is the biggest you know spend, right? So, right. so right. that means you need to have a lot of cash, uh, a flow. Uh, that meaning like a few million actually, or two one to two million Hong Kong dollar. But then what a start like company lacks is free money, right? So I think in that scenario, it would be quite great all right uh, i wouldn't say good but it's great if uh, hong kong can also have this similar type of upfront grants for a right. startup or small scale uh, company that can ease out uh, lots of uh, this kind of uh, cash flow issues right i, I think uh, from Zijian's point that that's totally correct reimbursement base is uh, is troublesome but another point is you can only apply for this type of award one time right you cannot apply next year and you know, uh, it's usually applicable to new companies uh, started within two years, and right. that's another issue, right? Because you you can remain in a small R and D company form for several years, and to apply for the award, you, you may have to dissolve your company or restructure, which makes things uh, more complicated. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. So uh, I think that there's another question, uh, probably a more general question about the, the pandemic. Uh, how does the pandemic uh, affect our, our, our research progress? Uh, is there any, like, a, you know, for example, uh, machines, equipment, or uh, our postdoc research scientists or engineers that uh, probably cannot or, or arrive late in Hong Kong because of due to the pandemic? Well, I think this is a major issue that needs to be immediately addressed by the government because all the technical engineers overseas cannot come to Hong Kong to repair or install instruments. This is a, a huge issue. Many, I think many universities, I think all schools are involved. They bought instruments to be installed, but their engineer cannot fly into Hong Kong for installation. Yeah. And being we, sitting we, in, a, in, in the corridor or shell for a long time. Yeah. Now we have a we have a machine which is yeah. was in the order of ten million, uh, twenty million uh, Hong Kong dollar machine stay in the lab, ideal for two years, without engineers coming. So uh, if it's so warranty already gone. <laughs> of, of course, that will not start using. So the warranty is still there. <laughs> but the things, if you look, if you if you discuss the loss in terms of the commercial way, let's say a a rate every year you have 10 percent loss for instance so you right. already lost a lot of money uh right. yeah this is a serious and also if it is broken as sushi said if the machine is broken i mean because usually hong kong doesn't has local support in the past years because it's very convenient for engineers coming from singapore from the mainland from taiwan and it's very easy the engineers can easily travel to Hong Kong, but now the pandemic is no. So my personally, my personal uh, lab are actually affected seriously due to this uh, lack of local engineers. Yeah. Right. Right. I see uh, Anderson turn on his camera. So probably he want to supplement <laughs> this. Not, re not really, but I, I, I just like to concur that indeed, uh, I think it's a, uh, is a huge issue and it's becoming bigger and bigger of an issue. Uh, and I think um, this raises, besides the problem of uh, border being open or not, whether engineers and people can come in to install and do the training, another problem that may be equally, if not more important, is that do we have enough local talents to build and maintain and um, it even or just install equipment? And if we continue to role in our investments in uh, research in these areas. It may be worthwhile for us to also groom our local talents, not only in conducting research projects, but also in designing, in building, and also maintaining our equipment. So maybe something worthwhile to think about as well. Well, I think it's the entire ecosystem, right? 
uh, is from the first start to the end. And, and, and uh, the problem in Hong Kong probably is because of the unhealthy ecosystem. Uh, we've got a very strong R&D in the institution, but then in the front and at the back is something missing. So then the chain doesn't go uh, 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 gear up very smoothly. And I think that, that, that uh, we, uh, I think we don't have, uh, I don't receive uh, new questions and then the time is almost there. So Anderson, would you like to wrap up a little bit before we end up in this, uh, in the uh, uh, workshop? Sure. So uh, first of all, thank you, Zijian, for uh, leading the section. And thanks very much to uh, Sichi and Mingxing for sharing with us some of the really exciting works. And these works not only have scientific significance, but also have very uh, strong applications and practical relevance. So we hope that uh, more, of, more of our research can be geared towards this direction. And these provide platforms for collaborations between scientists and industrialists to really realize the impact of our research for Hong Kong and for the innovation and technology ecosystems that uh, Zijian also mentioned in Hong Kong, Greater Bay Area to benefit uh, China and beyond. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. And it's been great to partner with the Hong Kong Young Industrialist Councils. And we hope that we'll bring to you more of these kind of workshops. Please stay tuned. Our uh, Young Academy of Sciences uh, have a lot of activities. Please um, follow our uh, website, our Facebook, and also our Instagram. You will see a lot of the announcements of our activities. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anderson. I also would like to thank uh, the organizing team, Ada, Oscar, uh, and uh, everybody uh, to organize this uh, wonderful event. And thank uh, Shi Qi and uh, Mingxin for giving a nice talk. So uh, for anyone, uh, the uh, public uh, and the industrialists, if you would like to know more or you can just uh, personally contact us or uh, you can send your uh, questions or any uh, requests uh, to our young uh, academies of sciences and we will do our very best to, to come back to you shortly. Okay, so I think without further ado, uh, I will say, uh, uh, this is the end of today's uh, uh, industrial workshop and I hope to see you guys either online or face-to-face -face, uh, in the near future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.